Hey neighbors, the handyman here with Handy DM Tips brought to you by Initiative Coffee Company. And today we're diving through Adventures League DDEX 1 1 Defiance and Flan, writer Sean Merwin, editors Claire Hoffman, Chris Tulatch, and Travis Woodall. This is a series of five one hour adventures set for tier one plays, specifically targeted for first level, and it's a great place to start for brand new players. Let's start with some general notes. 1. The module consists of 5 independent mini-adventures and aims at 1 hour apiece, so if you have a time limit, like we do on our weekly programs, you'll have to make some cuts. However, it's up to you where you make those cuts. Are you going to drop a whole mini-adventure, are you going to go start one after all the hooks, skip a combat? DMing is all about choices. Number 2. Because of the extra time built in, you have to keep an eye on the clock. I hate to rush new players, especially when they're trying to wrap their heads around a brand new hobby, but for us, this is just five hours of content and a four hour session. We have to keep things moving. Adjudicate and verify later. One mini adventure may take 20 or even 15 minutes instead of an hour. That's great. Take advantage of the bonus time. Three. Try to gauge where your players will struggle here. Is it combat, exploration, or social? If you need to cut a whole mini adventure, let player enjoyment decide which one. Remember. Your bards will feel most important in social encounters and your fighters will thrive in combat. Try to spread around the focus. Now Mini Adventure 1 is predominantly social and combat. Mini Adventure 2 is almost all combat. 3 is exploration and combat. 4 is social and exploration. And 5 is combat and social. So let's dive in. Mission 1. The meeting at Deep Night. Let's start with the big debate. Black text. Should you read it? Skip it? Summarize it? I have no idea. If you like the black text, read the black text. If not, Sean Merwin isn't looking over your shoulder. Skip it. Summarize it. For 1-1, one, one, I'll say this. The first paragraph of black text in each of the missions is largely all cut and paste. It can help establish a very cool locale and flan and can drive it home right from day one. And it can irritate your players with redundant narration. Keep an eye on them. If they aren't starting to use it as a refrain by the time mission three rolls around, they're not into it. Now, helping the Harper. Keep in mind factions are largely a thing of the past, and faction assistance is largely a thing of the past. If you have folks at your table who still have the faction agent background or safe haven background feature, that's great. They probably know who the Harpers are, even if they aren't one. That said, just because no one has a faction doesn't mean it's not important to establish that they exist. The Moonsea region is plagued by new cults and uprisings seemingly every September, and the idea that there are organizations dedicated to minimizing that threat is reassuring, even inspiring in future characters. Maybe your PCs aren't gaining rank with the Harpers. That doesn't mean they can't earn the respect of a Harper. I'll touch more on that in a bit. Now, this section has a lot of bullets. There are a couple of approaches. One, you can roleplay the Harper, and in a perfect world with no time limits, optimal player engagement, a great grasp of roleplaying techniques, of course this is ideal, but it could also be an opportunity to make up lost time. Two, you can introduce the character and read through the bullets over the course of a skipped interaction. This is quicker than option A and perhaps puts new players on the spot a touch less. But why introduce a new locale just to skip over being there, and why introduce a new NPC just to skip over who they are? Three, if you're planning on reading through the bullets anyway, just start at the barn. Skip the black text for now, start up after the meeting with the Harper, summarize the bullets and get straight to the work of saving the world. Use your own judgment here. Any of these will still advance the story. If you don't want to skip the introduction because it establishes the scene, run a different mission first. These are mini adventures. They build together, but not from each other. Finally, just because the Harper doesn't offer up gold pieces doesn't mean he isn't offering a reward. A jaded approach is hugs and handshakes, but if these players are coming back to your table each week, you may have something more valuable to offer. A favor. Season 1 has a lot of mysteries and a lot of information that has to be scoured before the adventure can really start. A Harper seems like a great source for a tip in exchange for services rendered. Make sure your players know that DMs at other tables are in no way required, expected, or even have any idea about a Harper owing them anything, but narratively at your table, you get to engage and reward your players. The meet at the barn and uninvited guests. Overall, a couple of things happen at the barn. One, the players encounter the Harper's cellar and exchange the not diamonds for what turns out to be a not dragon egg. Two, the players encounter a minor obstacle that should be easily overcome. Three, the players encounter a Thieves Guild faction, the Welcomers, and four, a fight may or may not ensue. 
The cellars are intended to be a brief social encounter that provides a minor hiccup for the players to manage. The objective here is to make the exchange, plant the pin, and find a reasonable excuse for the sellers to move along. Don't let yourself get bogged down in the details here. Any excuse should likely be enough to make the adventure move on its way. There are a few ideas on the easiest ways to plant the pin, but largely, your players are going to surprise you, especially new players. Roll with it. This may be their first D&D table ever. Reward them for their ideas, even if they aren't the best ideas. After the handoff is made, get the sellers out of there. The longer they're around, the more chance the players have of failing their infiltration mission. Beyond that, the combat encounter isn't meant for the seller anyway. There are thieves lying in wait. Speaking of the welcomers, they're hiding in the barn during the exchange. If things go very south with the buyer, they can be used to move things along, but you'll have to think on your feet. Try to find a way to support the character's completion of the mission rather than get in their way. This is tier one, maybe adventure one, and if your players are going to come back next time, they'll want to feel like they had an accomplishment. Now, some of the welcomers are on the balcony and can only be detected by characters on the balcony. My expectation is that this is because of the need to move the seller along. If the encounter is being spied on, the seller might flee before the exchange. Seller could get caught up in battle. The seller might expect a ruse of some kind, even if not specifically a Harper ruse. I know this direction seems super prescriptive, but it may be one that's just worth buying into. As always, though, it's up to you. When the welcomers do show themselves, Keep in mind the players might just want to walk away from the encounter. This is especially the case if they've already determined the egg to be a fraud. If they want to bail, let them bail. Maybe the Harper doesn't trust their assessment without seeing the egg himself, or maybe he does. Was well, the check made by a ranger, a druid, a knowledge or nature domain, cleric, an oath of ancients paladin, a cult infiltrator background? There are many circumstances that would lend themselves to a Harper deferring to a character's knowledge on the matter. If this table is coming back week after week, maybe their nature check is what grants them their renown. Maybe the rest of Flan is starting to take notice. But there's no combat, you might say. Well, there's four other mini-adventures. There will be combat. Don't worry. Of course... It's far more likely the players are going to want to sink their teeth into some dice rolling, and this is fine too. The welcomers on the balcony drop nets. The nets are cool. And they expose new players to conditions that are fairly easily mitigated. There's a lot of reason to use the nets. But if you're short on time or low on numbers, maybe skip the nets. It's a round a player potentially loses cutting their way out of a net. With the sun on the clock, if you are going to use the nets, think about targeting casters. Being restrained does very little to take away a low-level bard's agency. They can choose to get out of a net or tell a bandit he's a poorly dressed ninny for 3 damage. Think of this combat as an introduction to the system, even a combat tutorial. Yes, you can beef up the encounter. You can absolutely push your players to or beyond their limits here. But keep in mind, this is a tier 1 mod and likely you will have some first level characters. Hot dice will bring them down quick. Make adjustments, but keep an eye on the party. You shouldn't be surprised if one or two members drop, but if the battle ends with a single sole survivor, think about scaling back the rest of the mod a bit. In the end, the Harper has a potion of healing waiting for the party. Potions and scrolls are considered consumable items and given right there at the table without redeeming checkpoints or uh, using magic item vending machines. Now, mission two, the screams at night. The most important part of mission two is Madame Friona's regionally famous Wildberry Jam. Think about opportunities to provide touchstones for your players. Maybe jelly isn't the one you want to offer, but part of DMing these mods is providing context and narrative for Flan over the course of 14 adventures. Maybe the tea kettle is a meeting place for your characters with a criminal background, or your entertainer has special accommodations with Friona. Give your table something to care about here. Soon enough, the shouting starts. Distraught woman, more bullets? These are quick, just we'll play them out. Give Milliven some energy here. Her family was just taken away by goblins. The Black Fist don't care, but you should as the DM. Speaking of the Black Fist, if you're planning on running a big chunk of this season for your players, and I recommend it, Mission 2 here sets up what could be a very exciting rivalry between your characters and the inept and corrupt town guard. They're interested in nothing more than clearing the street. How do your characters feel about that? An intimidation check against these guards could spur on a recurring problem that's already built in to the rest of Season 1. That said, don't spend too much time here. Millivant is desperate to save her family and she's your biggest tool in pushing the story forward. 
Tracking through the bog. Once your party makes it to the peat bog, there's exactly one survival check to get to the goblin cave. Jazz it up. What does the bog smell like? How humid is it? Does the character that makes the check track footprints or broken sticks? Are there drag marks in the mud from the captives? Give some kind of narrative reward for the check. Also, don't ignore the success chart or bullets. Adding combatants based on the results of the check is an interesting way to provide hidden rewards for a job well done or consequences for a lack of success. Adding information for better checks is a classic opportunity to give players a chance to plan ahead. Err on the side of too much information for all of the same reasons we've talked about when thinking about Tier 1 adventures. The Lair Entrance. The Trek to the Lair is classic D&D. An hour of trudging through the swamp, hand-waved by one sentence of narrative. But as your players approach the cave, how do they approach the cave? Are they being stealthy? Do they scout around the cave before diving into the mouth of it? Do they cautiously approach the cave and try to hear what they can before committing? They don't have a lot of time here, and if they spend a bunch of it investigating, you should reward their efforts with some extra information, but also reward them with a lost captive. The black text here seems pretty targeted on groups who care enough to listen to it, so if they dive straight into the mouth of the cave, skip it. The Goblin Lair. This is a mini dungeon, and the first suggestion of a dungeon crawl that AL has to offer, if a bit half-hearted. That said, this section is a tried and true dilemma of most modules to some degree. There's a lot of information about the cave structure, who lived there, what the cult interests are in it, etc. All of that information is really interesting, but has no way of being disseminated to characters unless you make it happen. Are there notes from the Cult of the Dragon around? Is the party going to take one of the goblins hostage for information? There is a Zentarim captive, but how likely is he to share information with adventurers that aren't in the Black Network? Moving on to the cave itself. 2A, the entrance passage. Ten-foot ceilings, the cave is unlit unless otherwise stated. Halflings, humans, dragonborn, out of luck. Get a light source or go in blind. The first passage is a guarded murder hallway. If your party is charging forward, always toward victory, they might take a couple of crossbow bolts to the chest. These can be avoided with stealth, but keep in mind torches aren't very stealthy in dark corridors. Also, if your party decides to stand in front of an arrow slit after being attacked with crossbows, consider the possibility that those crossbows can be reloaded and fired again. The alarms are there, but could be put off another round if you want. That said, allow your players to make mistakes here and manage the consequences. It teaches good lessons when stakes are low. 2B, the trapped room. If the party charged in bullheaded, there's a good chance they're still charging. Be prepared for your players to just charge right through a tripwire and rocks fall. 2D4 damage could be very minimal. It also might not. Think about adjusting. The hidden door should be pretty easily telegraphed by your players. It's the only other way out of this room. And they may have just been shot by goblins past this room. Still, if the party isn't picking up the obvious tips, you may have to help them out. Is there a draft coming in? Echoes beyond the wall? Find a way to tip them off. 2C. The Guard Room. Goblins and wolves are ready for the party to move in. This could be a tricky fight depending on a few factors. Did the goblins in 2A alert their companions? Is the party considered strong? Did the party sneak up on the goblins? All of these have different consequences. If you want to make adjustments, keep in mind this isn't the final fight of the mini-adventure. Move through this combat and get to the good stuff. 2D, the boss and prisoners. The room is lit and houses captives and a handful of enemies. Did the goblins flee into the room at the end of the last fight? Throw them in. A good thunder wave here can really make short work, but don't forget about the friendlies. Also, keep in mind that bugbears have long reach, and when you run bugbears, have at it. Give them reach. When you run kobolds, give them grovel, cower, and beg. If wolves get their neat stuff, why not humanoids? Afterward, the party can and probably should free the prisoners. Here they encounter their first member of the Zentarim. Keep in mind how secretive the Black Network is before deciding to disseminate the information Chab has. Mission 3. The Dead at High Sun. I told you, as is becoming a theme, this mini-adventure starts in the tea kettle. Remember that whole if you're short on time, skip the tea kettle and meet straight at the thing you're investigating thing? Well, that. You can absolutely kick off Mission 3 at Valingen Graveyard. I hereby grant you permission. If you do, Summarize the bullets and get right to the heart of the matter. Brother Keefe is another good NPC that your players could grab onto for much of Season 1 
If nothing else, he should at least mention Doomguide Yover Glandon. The Doomguide plays a role in future Season 1 adventures as well as modules in future seasons. Still, move through this social encounter as quickly as your players allow. Second, the Mysterious Secret Doors. They have a pretty stout perception check associated with them, but they don't really do terrible damage. However, you are entitled to make adjustments based on the fun of your players. Sometimes this means challenging them more. If your party is a high APL, consider making the Secret Doors drop a player's maximum hit points rather than mere hit point damage. Third, you might think that a mission that takes place in a crypt is predominantly focused on combat, but the first encounter is a puzzle. Well, a puzzle and poisonous gas. In all reality, anyone familiar with Dungeons and Dragons will likely have some idea that the gems in the chest relate to chromatic dragons. Still, knowing the gems are relevant and knowing what to do with them are two totally different steps in the process. The characters need to look for a place to put them. This isn't a skill check with a DC, but it should be up to the players to tell you what they're doing. Put your players on a clock. I mean it, get a timer. Every five minutes, con save. I know the mod says no more con saves until they get a gem wrong, but stakes make drama. Drama means fun. I am a big proponent of clocks. It keeps players engaged and focused on the task at hand. You can use them in combat, puzzle encounters, or even just to make sure you as a DM include everyone. That said, once the players look at the puzzle box, they see slots in the shapes of gems. If you're feeling crafty, consider making tokens and handouts for the table to sort out the puzzle. Once it's solved, move on to the cowardice of Brother Keith. He refuses to go forward. This does a couple of things. One, it keeps Brother Keith around as an NPC that can be called upon again in the future. Remember, favors can be rewards. Two, it allows the characters to feel very brave for venturing into a dangerous crypt that even the caretaker won't dare enter. And three, it establishes a flaw in Brother Keith. 3A, the honor guard. Spooky... Dragon Skulled Skeletons. Most of the mini adventures here briefly touch on dragons. Eggs, teeth, maps to dragon layers, but this is the first real look into the real antagonist of Season 1. While the cult in the hard books is trying to summon Tiamat, the cult presented in the Season 1 modules is more purist in their pursuits. All they aim for is the creation of a Draco Lich. It's actually super bad news. It's also most clearly represented in this adventure by spooky Dragon Skulled Skeletons. Characters might be real excited to sit on a throne and activate these skeletons. Thrones are cool. Sitting on them makes you feel important, and if that happens, your characters will likely feel foolhardy for triggering skeletons. Of course, this will also point out a secret compartment trapped with poison darts. If the party is a high APL, think about changing the trap up a little bit. Maybe it deals one point of bit damage and applies the poison condition until the save is made. Maybe the poison lasts three rounds. Who knows? Get creative. If the party is a low APL, do not give them the poison condition. Don't be mean. Either way, it contains a scroll of comprehend languages. Scroll of comprehend languages is pretty cool. The guidance for the combat adjustments seems okay, but as always, keep an eye on your party and make adjustments on the fly, adding or subtracting hit points, etc. 3B. The Reanimation Chamber, a small alchemical lab with the greatest test your characters have encountered yet. A sign that says, do not drink. My estimation here is that someone at your table is going to want to drink that potion. And someone at your table is probably going to take 21 points of poison damage and at level 1, likely die. Anyway, the intent of the mission is that the characters complete the potion and fight the skeletons, but... It is entirely possible that your players aren't altogether interested in completing a necromantic ritual beyond their reckoning. I mean, I've never seen it come up, but sometime it's sure to happen. If this is the case, don't fret about skipping a skeleton fight and moving to the teleportation circle. They've already completed their task and set the stage for the cult. Of course, if the characters do complete the ritual by making very dangerous potion that they totally won't drink themselves, maybe, a combat ensues. Spooky dragon skulled skeletons. 3C, a teleportation circle. The end of the line here is a spooky inert teleportation circle. It looks like the fears of Brother Keef are coming to fruition. A dragon, you say? In Flan, during a season named Tyranny of Dragons? Amazing! Still, the last combat in the crypt is zombies. These zombies are special zombies because they're tied to the teleportation circle's dormant energies. There are a few ways to approach this. You might treat them as zombies with a secondary way to kill them, disabling their glyphs. Or, you might treat this encounter as a puzzle to solve. 
Maybe the only way to overcome their undead fortitude is to destroy or disable the glyphs. Keep in mind, this is going to stretch out combat, so you should be long on time if you do it this way. Also, you should be very clear that when the zombies go down, the glyphs flicker before they get back up. Also, there's a force cage thing in the room that can trap your players. I don't really know why it's here, but if you like it, trap your players to your heart's content. If not, get rid of it. The end of this mission informs Brother Keith, as well as the party, that there are powerful actors afoot performing grave misdeeds. Brother Keith even brings up the fear of a Draco Lich, explicitly setting the scene for the rest of Season 1. Mission 4, a shock at Evenfeast. Truth be told, when I run this module, this is where I start. It serves a couple of purposes. One, it establishes the location and lets the players participate within the tea kettle, giving it further stakes. And two, it, it makes sure I make time for socially focused characters. That said, it can either take 15 minutes or an hour and a half, depending on how long the players take and how involved their RP goes. A mission like this is another great place to use your timer. When the party breaks off into many social encounters, give them a fixed amount of time, say two minutes or until they roll a social check. Make a note of the roll and move on to the next player or group. When you make your way around the entire table, start from the top and resolve the checks. Combat focused characters might not be super interested here. If they want to pass on their time, that's fine but make sure that's their choice. The magic item the party is trying to track down is a dragon tooth contained within glass, but there's magic items at five of the six tables. When the tooth starts hurting people, it does so in a very specific order based on possession of items from the quivering forest. This is a pretty specific identifier, and if all the clues are discovered, it makes short work of the mystery, but they all require nature checks. If the clues are missed, you'll need to rely on information given by NPCs or Burl coming back to help Keep in mind, Surik has a healing potion at table 1. She may not give it up freely, but the right persuasion could give the party a vital resource. Also, don't forget to dive into the characters here. The NPCs have a lot of interesting characteristics, and give a lot of color to the tea kettle in the region at large. Bottling Lightning To resolve the issue, a character needs to be near the current victim, covered or touching a substantial amount of stuff from the quivering forest, and be in possession of the tooth. That's a lot of requirements, and if you want to skip one of them to move the adventure along, go for it. Wrapping up. If the party gives the tooth back to Burl, he rewards them with another potion of healing. If not, they're rewarded with a problem. Someone gets lightning vulnerability. Don't spill the beans on this until it comes up. It might be fun for all parties involved. Mission 5. The Danger at Dusk. This is one more mission that can start at the action. Skip the tea kettle, go straight to the Lyceum, and summarize the bullets from Rilo Leadstopper. This gets the party to the action sooner, and because Rilo is the one that takes you to the Lyceum, still gives you the opportunity to introduce and give life to the NPC. The Secret Prison. Once the party heads down the sewer and gets in the secret entrance, they're in a low-lit prison with 10-foot ceilings and cries and mutters from prisoners. 3A. The Prisoners. Thieves' tools are a heavy blow get you through the door, but keep in mind the ladder immediately alerts the nearby guards. Now your party needs information specifically about the whereabouts of Valona. They can stealth their way to other prisoners, bluff their way to the information with the guards, or beat up the guards and take the information through more violent means. Keep in mind there are three pillars of play, and all of them are equally valuable and should be equally rewarded. That said, dice sometimes mean plan A doesn't work out. Make adjustments, but if plan A fails, it should feel chaotic for your players for a bit. 3B, the guard room. Your players are infiltrating a prison. There are obviously guards, but the guards in this room aren't in uniform, so it is possible that the characters at your table want to bluff their way in. Awesome, that's great. That said, they're entering the guard room from the prison cells out of uniform and came in through a secret door. The chances of this being successful are limited, but you get to pick how limited. If it comes to a fight, remember the guards are unarmored and their AC is 11. Strong parties are the exception here. 3C, the funhouse. Approaching Valona's cage is going to trigger a tough fight with a Grick. The monster alone can be pretty challenging for a standard APL group, but this battle is made even trickier because of the environmental hazards in the obelisks. The save isn't terrible, but if a couple of characters fail, it could cause a hiccup. That said, remember the fear effect only hinders attacks against the source, the obelisk, but other attacks, attacks against the Grick, are unaffected. The party might destroy the obelisk, 
Great, they overcame an environmental hazard. The party may just grab Valona and flee. Great, they minimize the battle and accomplish the mission they were given. When dealing with the missions, keep in mind the objectives. The task is to rescue someone. Killing a monster is an essential. Be excited about your table focusing on the tasks they're given. The danger at dusk ends with another healing potion, contact, and potential favor from one pretty handy gnome and another well-connected one. So there's DDEX 1-1 Defiance and Flam, five one-hour mini-adventures. Overall, I really like this module. You can cut out what you need to, run four instead of five mini-adventures. It introduces a lot of concepts for new players. There's plenty of opportunity for social and exploration components of the game, and it opens the doors to one of my favorite seasons of Adventures League. Dragons are iconic. They're part of the name. Anyway, thank you so much for taking some time to listen to some advice on Defiance Flan. Be a good neighbor. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Leave us your own comments on the mod down below. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon. And from now until the next time, roll together. <laughs>